are you now at a point where if your kids search you you're like i'm happy with what they see hey guys this is tempest from russell talk and i'm reminding you to support tom talks rubbish What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Tom Talk Flourish, and today I'm back with another interview. This time, I'm joined by Will Washington from Grapsody, Day After Dynamite, and what was the other thing? Because my brain just went blank. I do apologize. It's all right. No, uh, yep, yeah, I'm Will Washington. I host primarily Grapsody. That's mostly what I'm known for uh, over on Fightful, youtube.com slash Fightful every Saturday. Uh, and then, yeah, I host Day After Dynamite for Fightful Overbooked. And then I'm also the host of Beyond the Bells uh, for Women's Wrestling Army. And I host that that drops every other week. Uh, mm. And so I, I'm, I'm busy. That's basically you're a you very busy say, guy. So, so yes. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to appear on a very small channel like mine. <laughs> That's all right. I'm happy to. And I'm glad you asked. So if we take this back, because I love to go back to the beginning with my guests about where they discovered wrestling. Where does Will first discover wrestling? Birth. Uh, that's one of those things where I've been watching it my entire life. Uh, when I was growing up, I didn't know people didn't watch it because my brother, my brothers were fans. My dad was a fan. And so I just grew up in a house that it was on and, you know, six Oh five on a Saturday, six Oh five Eastern. So, um, keep in mind that I was born in California. So that would have been three Oh five West coast time uh and very very just, early my time yeah <laughs> it would have been just middle of the afternoon and i would watch my wcw saturday night as a kid and then uh you know that obviously parlayed into monday nights and uh i just happened to be growing up in the right time period because i i was uh the Monday Night War hit right as I was kind of discovering myself as a kid. Ooh. And so that's where I got to really get to explore my my fandom hugely. And yeah, I've been a fan my entire life. Pro wrestling and me are pretty synonymous. I haven't had a, a piece of my day or my time go by that it didn't exist. It's actually my frame of reference for like everything in my life. Oh, really? So like a special event, for example, do you have to pull up? If that was for a year like for example what happened in wrestling that year for example right so yeah a, a good example is um you know if a friend of mine is asking hey what year did such and such happen or even what month all i have to think of is what was going on in wrestling at that point mm-hmm. and uh usually i can kind of narrow down the two one of my running jokes for the last like 10 years, I've always told the story of that. I always remember when I lost my virginity because it was the night Triple H returned from injury at Madison Square Garden in 2002. So I know that that was January 7th, 2002. uh, And I'll never forget that. Fair enough. So if we continue on your wrestling journey, it sounds like the answer is going to be no. Have you had like a drop-off period? No, not at all. Uh, I suppose the closest I ever came was about end of 2018 or I guess the middle of 2018. I was kind of getting sick of a lot of things. Um, But I'll say that uh, All In as a pay-per-view really and as a concept really drew me in and reminded me of what things could be and how much fun I could have with pro wrestling. And that was the closest I ever came, but I didn't fully drop off. I think I stopped watching Raw for almost like two years at that point. and even still off and on, I didn't really like start watching Raw consistently again until like two months ago. Uh, but mm-hmm. for the most part, I had really fallen off with it as I, I'd say that was my biggest drop off was cutting Raw out because I had seen every Raw from 1993 till about 2018. Oh, and wow. Then, uh, and then around that time, I was just uh, it just wasn't appealing to me anymore. And I recognized that. uh it's hard for me to complain about things that other people enjoy. 
And so I was like, you know what? I'm kind of done complaining about this. It's just not for me. And so I gave it up. And really until Cody returned, uh, I, I didn't, uh, I maybe could count on one hand how many full episodes of Raw I had watched. Fair enough. Uh, how do I phrase this question? Like, if you, have you ever been watching and thought, okay, I'm going to drop off. But then like, what is an era that maybe you were like, okay, I wish I'd missed that now maybe looking um, back honestly i don't really have one of those because uh i just mentally am a bit of a completionist and i honestly hate having gaps in any of my memories mm-hmm. and so uh even if it's something i didn't terribly love um i do feel like it is hard to not have it stored up here so i at least need to know what happened and uh, i don't really feel like there is a period that uh I would want to kind of wipe from my brain just because I don't know, maybe one day I'll need it for a quiz show or something. Shout out Quizlemania. Yes. Will Will Washington for Quizlemania champion, please. <laughs> uh, any should be before I start fanboying, because I am mm-hmm. such a big fan of your good self. Uh, Thank you. where is like where is does your podcasting journey begin? I'm sorry, what was that? Sorry, that was a wordy question. I'll start that again. Where does your podcasting journey begin? Ah, uh, June 18th, 2005, uh, I started a podcast called RBR Weekly Wrestling Talk. It's a podcast that's still running to this day. Um, I had the idea in, it's, it sounds crazy to even say I had an idea for wrestling podcast because there's so many right now who has an idea. But mm-hmm. back then there were two other wrestling podcasts in existence and I realized that it was a market that hadn't been tapped yet. Uh, there were, most podcasts at the time were usually about tech. And I, I'm a big tech guy. I don't know people who don't know this, but I am a software developer. I worked in hardware for a really long time. I've been in tech pretty much my whole work. I found career. this out through research because you did an interview when Grapsty first started with a good friend of mine, Anthony, from the Anthony podcast. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I watched that for my research. What a uh, guy, by uh, the way. Yeah, love him. Uh, and yeah, so I had uh, I had decided to like, did I just want to talk about tech? That would have been pretty easy, but I feel like that market was saturated. And the only other things I know besides technology are, I guess, uh, pro wrestling and like rap music. And I thought, uh, let me try pro wrestling. And so I decided to start a pro wrestling podcast. Uh, and I had reached out to. Uh, three guys, Michael Z, Nick Marsico, and Anthony Scats. Uh, and they were kind of the foundation for me doing a podcast. And uh, pretty much I got the same response from all of them. Nobody knew what a podcast was at the time mm-hmm. because at the time, Apple hadn't even gotten into podcasts yet. Podcasting was something where you had to have a specific podcast application on your PC downloaded. You had to hook your iPod up, wait overnight, and then the RSS feed would feed um your podcast onto your device and then when you woke up in the morning you'd have your podcast and uh it was just podcasting really was just about the distribution more so than the content but in the content um i wanted to do a show where we gathered on skype Uh, michael z at the time lived in kalamazoo michigan nick marsco lived in new jersey anthony scats lived in philadelphia i lived in uh, denver colorado and so the four of us had four different perspectives on pro wrestling that we could all bring together i was the youngest on the show at the time scats is about but his birthday's in May. I'm um, October, so he's five months older than me. Um, Michael Z was about four years older than me. Nick Barsco is like two years older than me. I was the youngest on the show, but I was the one who was kind of running things. I had experience with editing at the time. I was like fresh out of high school. And so that was my idea was to do a wrestling podcast. And what was cool was because of the fact that we had started so early on in the game and we started out of a community because we were... Um, we were a part of IGN, actually. We uh, not like a part of the official IGN, but IGN had a message board community. It was huge yeah. at the time. It's one of the biggest message board communities on the internet at the time. And they had a wrestling board called the Wrestling General Board. And the four of us were frequent posters there. And so originally, when we launched the podcast, we just posted it to that message board. But what was cool was that was a built-in audience already. That message board had 
like a thousand users at the time. So that was a really easy way for us to immediately develop an audience that would listen to us. Uh, we would do live streams. They would show up on, uh, in the streams, be in the chat and all of that. So when we finally expanded out and uh, we launched the website and we put it all out there, everybody just kind of came with us. And yeah. so it was from the beginning, uh, I had never had to do a podcast where we really had to like hunt for an audience. We had and one almost from day one. The void, I think, is a phrase you used in a pre in that previous interview, right? Yes, uh, and we we didn't. We never really had to, and that was what was kind of the cool part about the way we had launched back then. And that's really where podcasting began for me. I I did a couple of other podcasts after that. I hosted a show called Now Playing Now, which was a movie review podcast, uh, and I did Ooh. that for a few years. Um, I hosted that with Darren Reynolds, Brandon Burge, uh, Derard Wilkinson, Heidi Vio. Um, two of those four people I just named are still really good friends of mine. And uh, like I try to see Heidi every chance I get. As a matter of fact, going to Double or Nothing last year, I had a layover in North Carolina where she currently lives and uh, we got to hang out. But yeah, I did, nice. uh, I did that podcast for, uh, let's see, that ran from 2008. Last episode we did was 2012. So I did that for four years. And uh, I did a morning show called Morning Toast with Michael Z. Um, and so I've been podcasting pretty much as much as I can. I don't, I don't think a week of my life has gone by without podcasting since I was 17 years old. And to put that in perspective for folks, I'm 34. So oh, wow. long time. Uh, I've been doing this uh, again. Like I said, the RBR that I mentioned, I hosted for 16 years. Uh, that's going to probably when it's all said and done, still be the longest stretch. I don't know how long I'm going to do Grapsity. Um, I would love to say I'm going to do it forever, but you know, things don't last forever. Um, at the moment though, RBR represents the biggest stretch of my podcasting run. Before we get into Grapsity, you mentioned that you left RBR in you you said what month but my brain's gone blank september september, september of, last year, yes. of last year correct yes why september did you why did you ultimately leave RBR? um it was mostly for my own mental health i uh i guess this is the first time or first place i'll really put that out there that i for a long time was not happy with the show um and uh, there was just a lot of clashing visions when it came to the show. And I recognized that I could very easily have uh, put my vision out there. I mean, I could have uh, forced RBR into what I wanted it to be, but I recognized that um, there were basically other personalities on the show that didn't want it to be that. Yeah, and yeah. so for me, I just realized that in order to see my vision of what I wanted a podcast to be at that stage of my life. Um, because here's the thing. I, it's not to say that RBR wasn't who I was at one point, but I did recognize that uh, I grew up on that show, right? I was 17 when I started. I was 33 when I left. And uh, having grown up in front of, the audience, one of the things that had changed for me was my vision on what I wanted uh, my online representation to be. And really, I wanted it to be representative of who I am. And RBR at its core is, uh, for better or worse, it, it's a very cynical show. It's a very, um, uh, and it can be raunchy, it can be cynical, it can be over the top. And for a long time, that represented a lot of who I was, but I would say for the last maybe three years, it hasn't. Uh, I, I feel like I tried to approach things in a more positive manner. I try to uh, not down on things so much. And, and really, uh, at my truest of true motivations really what it was and i said this to the guys at the time was that i really wanted to create something that my kids could search my kids are on the internet now my my daughter is 11 she uh, is on the internet a lot my son is starting to use the internet a little bit and as they start to look up their dad and things that their dad says and does on the internet i was questioning for a long time is am i putting out something that i would be proud if my kids found and i jokingly jokingly used to say on rbr all the time the answer to that was no um and so 
really by the end of my run on that show, I had just realized that my vision for what I wanted to put out wasn't necessarily what RBR was anymore. And I had to ask myself one of two questions. Do I either want to force RBR into something it's not because clearly the audience still likes that? Or do I want to just go off and do something that I am more proud in of in the sense that it represents who I am today. And I think that was ultimately my motivation behind leaving RBR. I appreciate you being so open with that, by the way. Uh, That's actually well, like the first time I've really put that out there. And I'm sure oh, that wow. will probably ruffle a couple of feathers. But uh, for the most part, that's really what it was. I'll ask you a question off camera about editing and what have you. So if you want anything taken out, like, no, let me know. That's okay. I said it and it's said. That's what it's got to be. Okay. Like, moving on. So mm-hmm. what comes next in your life? Uh, Grapsity? Yeah. So pretty much it was uh, kind of instant. You know, the, the first thing I did when I was doing um rbr was i had uh that last year of rbr those last couple of months actually i had started a a youtube channel called um wrestling with will and i found this by the way in my research yep well uh that was that was my first attempt at doing something that again i wanted my uh my kids to be able to find if they found it and wanted to know the kind of wrestling content I was making. That was more so what I wanted them to find. And so I had done a show called wrestling. Uh, I started wrestling with my friends, which was a show where I was going to, where, where, what I did was I introduced my non wrestling friends to pro wrestling. And uh, I did uh, a few episodes of that, but then I found out um, that was a really hard show to do around copyright strikes. Right. Uh, Because essentially um, it was very difficult to show the wrestling without uh, the either way. It, it was a little yeah. bit easier for AEW content. The WWE content I had made pretty much all got snatched down. As someone it's, that runs uh, a podcast with Cassidy Haynes, where we watch mm-hmm. wrestling every week, I feel your pain, brother. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Right. And it was it was tough. So that was a tough show to do. Um, and then I started doing the uh, interviews and I had uh, Daniel official was kind enough to be my first. And then I had Baron Black come on with me and uh, just doing the one on one interviews were a lot of fun. And then I started a show called Wrestling with Weekends. And the goal behind that show was, again, to just kind of take myself out of the uh, the negative space a little bit and do a show where I just kind of get got to geek out about pro wrestling in a way that that's that's who I am and that's what I like doing is I I, I very much am uh, I I'm a fan of this stuff and I have fun watching it and if I'm not having fun watching it then I don't want to do it and so when I'm talking about it I want to have fun talking about it and so that was the goal behind wrestling with weekends and it was to have a rotating cast of people and I did that every Saturday and uh, and then. And I was doing that alongside RBR for a little while. And on the second episode of Wrestling with Weekends, so the first one I had uh, my good friend Jesse Davin on. Um, on the second episode, I had Phil Lindsay on. And Phil and I had previously done a podcast. We did um, the Revolution 2021 review podcast. And after the show was over, he and I sat around and talked for like three or four hours. We became great friends after that. Did you and- have that moment where, because people that I've spoken to have had that moment of like, why not why are we still talking but like we're still talking and no one's listening this would be great content Yo, yeah i've had that plenty of times you know i i've said to maria candelas plenty of times she and i have had some phenomenal conversations in the past to where i'm like you know what this would have been like a great interview if there were just like a camera right here um and uh it's same with uh denise salcedo she and i have had just amazing conversations where we'll just sit around and, and talk. And I, I have said one time that we, one day she and I have to do just like a riding in a car with Will and Denise, because mm-hmm. uh, uh, when she and I ride in a car together, we just get really, really chatty. And uh, it, it would be funny if we did that as a podcast, but yeah, it was Phil and I, we did the second episode of wrestling with weekends and it was the review of the CM punk podcast or the, the CM punk review. It was, uh, the night after um, the first dance. And so, again, it was just kind of a morning of getting to geek out about pro wrestling. We were all really excited. Phil was there at the United Center for that. Ooh. 
And so um, at that point, I knew after that show was over, Phil was somebody I wanted to kind of podcast with for a long time. Um, I knew that that was, uh, that he was just the right guy for me. And then really it was, I want to say, it was September 10th, 2021, that I reached out to, uh, and it was such a last minute thing, uh, as Reg will tell you, I was trying to come up with a new guest for Wrestling With Weekends, and uh, I recognized that I didn't have one for, uh, September 10th was a Friday, and I didn't have a guest for Saturday. And on September 10th, I reached out to Reg, and I was like, hey, uh, listen, are you busy tomorrow? I really need a guest for Wrestling With Weekends. And Reg was like, yeah, sure, I'm in. Uh, and so Reg and I did the show September 11th that morning, and we, again, just had a great show. Got to talk about the Black Wrestling's 500. Um, and we just, the chemistry was there. We were having great conversation, just talking about the shows we were talking about. And after the show was over, or, so right before the show ended, actually, I said to Reg, hey, let me have you on again sometime. We got to have you back. And Reg said, yeah, that'd be great. Maybe one day me, you, and Phil do something. And that was where the light bulb moment hit. And I... The next day, I spent the whole day just thinking about it. I thought, okay, Reg was on to something. Me, him, and Phil, Mm -hmm. that's the right combination. That's the three. And that Monday, I approached Phil, and I said, you know me, I've been podcasting for a long time, and I have no intention of stopping, but I kind of have a different vision for what I want to see for podcasts, and I think I see reg and phil in that vision and phil was like i'm in and then i went to reg after that and i said okay phil's in this is my vision this is what i think i want to do and reg was in and at that point that was kind of the birth of grapsity the name kind of came to me on a car ride after that i had already known sean ross sap and i knew that uh that was kind of an option for where grapsity could be and so I reached out to Sean maybe three days later. Uh, Once we had kind of a game plan of what Rhapsody was going to be, Sean was all in and he ran it by Jimmy Van. They brought us on. Rhapsody was born. And that's how I ended up there. Fair enough. I know you might not be able to tell me about this, but Phil mentioned during our interview that there was a pitch from another outlet on for Rhapsody. Is that something you can confirm? Um, uh, yeah, that's something that could be confirmed. I can't say who, um, because it's really irrelevant at this point, but yeah. Um, I mean, you know, at that, at that point though, I, I knew I was really, um, like I said, I, I felt like the community over at Fightful was, was right. And I felt like the space at Fightful was right. I feel like Fightful was in a really great place as far as what they were producing. I felt like uh, they had broken the CM Punk story earlier in the year. They had they were really having just a great year in terms of mm-hmm. proving their credibility in the wrestling universe to the point of where the amount of hate they had developed um, was so fascinating because of the fact that uh, among everybody I knew in wrestling media, and I've known a lot of people for a long time, I really appreciated how much due diligence Sean did with his information. Um, And I recognized that as far as anybody I would want to be around uh, producing this type of content, really, those were the guys I wanted to do it with. And so uh, there wasn't really another option as far as I was concerned. Um, That's not to say that there weren't other people who were interested, but there were definitely, I felt like, there was only one place I really wanted to do it at that stage. Fair enough. And I apologize for digging there. That was just my journalist. Nope, that's okay. Uh, um, th- Doing wh- your due diligence. You Whatever should ask. that word Those is. Are you know you what I mean? Ask. Yeah. Yeah. So it, as we continue on to Grapsody, like how, who do you think, actually, like, I'll phrase it this way. Like if one of you said, I want to step away from Grapsody, if Phil came to you and said, look, I want my Saturdays back or from whatever Reg came to you or you came to them. Do you think it's something that could work without the three of you? Or is it like, if one of us steps away, we all step away. Um, so I was the first to miss an episode, right? I missed last week's episode uh, and SP3 stepped in. And, uh, shout out SP3. SP3 did a phenomenal job. With what that. a guy. Well, I love SP3. Um, 
I feel like at the moment, Grab City is the three of us. Um, but I also, one of the things I learned in doing RBR for 16 years is that, uh, and, and part of why I'm really proud of those guys for continuing to do the show right now and continuing on because RBR, of course, started with myself, Anthony Scats, Nick Marsico, and Michael Z. Michael Z left first. And I was panicked. I thought this show's not going to work without Michael Z. And then Jason Gallup came in. Show was great uh, with suddenly this new combination. And then Anthony Scats left. Paul Griffin came in. And again, the show was great. And then it, that was the point where I realized because time started going on, right? Jason Gallup leaves. And uh, then Matt Galloway comes in. Then Nick Marsico leaves. And then Matt Gallup, or and then Felipe Diaz Vera came in. And then Felipe Diaz Vera left. And then. Uh, Maxwell Baumbach came in and then Eric Brady came in in place of Matt Galloway. And then uh, Maxwell Baumbach left and then comes Cody and then Eric Brady left and in came and then I left. And then uh, now they have the host lineup they have. And the point I'm making with all of that is that it can feel in the moment like a show that's having success is successful because of specifically who was on it and to an extent that's true but i also feel like once a show kind of figures out what it is and what it needs to be then i think as long as everybody adheres to the vision of it uh you can continue with really anybody and i think that's what makes grapsity so great is the fact that um, I think at the moment, I love the three of us because I love our chemistry. I love hanging out with those guys. I love it when it when it isn't just us on camera, when the three of us are in person and we're just riding around in a car and we're just having a good time. Um, you know, we've gotten to do that in Dallas uh, this past year. We got to do that in Las Vegas. I love that about the three of us. Um, if one of us decided to step away, I think it depends on the circumstances of why, but I th- probably think... At this stage, it could continue, but I don't know. I love the three of us as a trio, and I'm hoping that for the time being, it just gets to stay that way for a little while. Fair enough. As we look at going into my final couple of questions, because I do want to be respectful of your time, uh, something you brought up early on in the interview, and I am really curious to know, like you said that you left B, 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 R, R or B, R, B, R, like I said, R, B, R, sorry. Uh, because you were getting worried about your kids seeing the content that you were creating. Are you now at a point where if your kids search you, you're like, I'm happy with what they see? hundred percent. Um, I think my kids know all my content. Uh, my daughter's watched Scrap City before. Um, and she's all specially watched the interviews cause she's a big fan of Jade Cargill. She's a big fan uh, of, um, of red velvet. And we've of course had them both on the show. Uh, so that's always been kind of cool. Um, and again, I do day after dynamite. Uh, and that is a show again, where, uh, it's not to say everything on the show is positive, but I approach it from the standpoint of, look, I'm watching a show. I like, I'm not going to like everything, but I am at least going to really accentuate the stuff that we do like, because that's what the show is there for. Uh, and uh, I'm getting to do beyond the bells. And I think, what women's wrestling army is doing for women's wrestling is a very great thing. And I think just getting to be a part of that and getting to help push and enhance Maria Canales' vision for women's wrestling. I think anything I can do to assist that. And that's what I told her when I took on the role of host of that show is that all I want to do is help her get her vision of women's wrestling out there. And so for me, yeah, I'm very proud of that content. I'm very proud of all the content I'm making. And that's not to say that maybe one day when my kids are adults, if they looked back at some of the stuff we did and said on RBR, uh, that I would want that like scrubbed from the internet. It's I don't. I feel like I grew up on that show. I feel like people could see my evolution as a human. Hopefully, that's the thing people could see. You know, I had some not great moments on that show where uh, I got called out for certain things I had said or certain views I had had by a listener who had called me out and we had conversations, we had discussions and I looked back and went, you know what, that was misguided. That was not the right way to be. That was not the right way to approach that. And I'm going to change my view on that. And so, yeah, I got to have some real 
moments that I am proud of that I grew up with that I, I got to um, show my what I would feel expansion as a human in front of the world. And so, um, or at least in front of that audience and they know me really well. And so, uh, I definitely wouldn't take any of that back. Okay. As we look at wrapping this up, uh, we're going to do a quick segment that I call generic questions. Those of you that have seen my interviews before will know this is where I ask my guests their favorite match, favorite pay-per-view, favorite tag team, uh, favorite superstar and favorite theme song of all time. Basically questions that I'm sure will get asked on social media quite regularly. And now he'll have a place to be like, look, guys, I've answered this. Please go watch this. So what's your favorite match of all time, Will? Um, you know what? It's actually fairly recent, uh, but I've watched it so much and it never and it hasn't lost its luster to me. But it is the tag team match between the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega and Hangman from Revolution 2020 in which the hangman it was of course in chicago illinois wouldn't trust arena february 29th uh favorite match ever i think that is the perfect encapsulation of storytelling of uh in-ring action of a lively crowd everything you could want out of pro wrestling happened in that match favorite uh paid for you of all time uh favorite pay-per-view is probably wrestlemania 17 hmm Generic uh, answer, I know, but I know, uh, I know. I've seen and it a million times. That's and... why, no disrespect, because we're running out of time. I've not gone too deep into that answer because do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's fine. Favorite uh superstar. Uh all time. Um yeah. you know, uh Sting. It's Ooh. it's Sting. Uh I was a big Sting fan as a kid, and uh you know, I, I pretty much I loved Sting and Man Called Sting era. I love uh, the I right around the time I turned ten was when he introduced the Crow character, and Perfect I was age. all about the Crow. And then, uh, and I feel like seeing him now and getting to end his career with this run that he's having right now. There's no better way I could think of wanting to see one of my childhood heroes go out. So at the moment, uh, the answer is Sting. Just a quick question on this. Like, what is your thoughts on the bumps he's taking? Like the big <laughs> jumping off things. Love it. I think that when I saw that headline that Newsweek put out when Sting signed about what well, it said, Sting signs with all elite wrestling, but don't expect him to get too physical. And Sting said, huh, that sounds like a dare. And Sting has been <laughs> out there just doing his thing. I love it. I've been at multiple Sting matches. I was there at Double or Nothing last year against the Men of the Year. I was there when he and Darby faced FTR. I was there uh, when Sting and Darby and Sammy Guevara faced uh, Matt Hardy, Andrade, and uh, Isaiah Cassidy at Revolution. Um, and I just recently at Forbidden Door got to see Sting do his thing. I saw sure him got to jump off something huge. And I was screaming my head off. I love it. I love getting to see Sting in this element. I'm having so much fun with this run of Stings. Uh, you could ask for more. As a fan, love it. Fair enough. And then just quickly, favorite tag team and favorite theme song of all time? Favorite tag team. Uh, you know, this answer probably changes throughout the years. Like my favorite tag team currently like I'm between FTR and the Young Bucks, like uh, as far as what I love in pro wrestling, those two kind of encapsulate it. Um, like the New Day is an easy answer to give, but they're also a trio and they defy what a normal tag team um, is and could be. Uh, so like I... But you know what, though? I feel like my favorite era of tag team wrestling is still really the current era of tag team wrestling. So I am going to say the New Day. Fair enough. And then favorite theme song of all time? Oh. Uh, again, it's an answer that could change a lot. But at the moment, I'm actually going to say. <sighs> know your role, new version the rocks theme from 99 to 2001 i it's, think is like the is perfect that the one song. where he keeps going it's cooking 
No, 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 no. That was uh, uh oh, that Hill one Wolf. is that, was that one is actually called um is cooking the uh, uh I'm referring to the theme he really had his most notoriety with, and that was the ah. '99 theme. Um, the first if you smell one, uh, it was on WWF the Music Volume Four. Ah. Um, honestly, I think that theme just with its bass line, with the the power in the drums, the way it kicks in as hard as it does. Uh, I think that theme is the perfect theme for a superstar. And I think that literally you could play it anywhere. People recognize it. I don't think there's a better theme song to me than that. Fair enough. And then as we look at wrapping this up, the question that I end all my interviews on is with YouTube, with podcasting, with social media in general, we're all sort of going to live forever in some sort of weird way. So what is one video that you want the good people's check out to know your body of work? And then what is one that you're like, if you could leave that one alone, I would appreciate it. Uh, again, I'm proud of all my content. Um, and I will continue to be proud of all my content because, uh, you know, I even just recently listened to the first episode of RBR that I ever did. It's cringeworthy, but uh, I'll say that it's me. And that was me at 17 getting started doing this. And it's out there. And if you want to listen to it, go ahead, rbrwrestling.com. Um, but the... I would say one of the ones I'm most proud of, and it's actually my pinned tweet, is my interview with Danielle Fischel. And a big part of that is because uh, Danielle Fischel is one of the most famous names from the 90s, uh, having been on Boy Meets World and having been a big part of that. People know who Topanga is. And for me to get to sit down with her and really pick her brain about pro wrestling, something that she's not really known for, but something that she's known for liking was just a lot of fun. And I got cool information out of her. We had great laughs. Um, I reminded her that she was in an interview or that she was in a movie with The Rock and she didn't even know it. Um, and so that to me is one of my favorite pieces of content I've ever done. There's a reason it's my pinned tweet. Uh, I that is really just cream of the crop content to me. Plus I ha also have two songs on the AEW who we are album. And uh, that's also content that I'm really proud of. And if you've never heard in the mix, the red velvet story, that song I produced and uh, I'm really proud of that as well. Congratulations. Uh, all your success is very well deserved, but as we wrap this up, where can the good people find you and your content? Uh, I am on Twitter. Uh, William RBR is my Twitter handle. Um, I can be found on Grapsity every Saturday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. That's at youtube.com slash Fightful. Airs every Saturday, again, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. I also host Day After Dynamite on Fightful Overbook. That airs every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And that's at youtube.com slash Fightful Overbook. And then, of course, I also host Beyond the Bells, for Women's Wrestling Army. You could follow Women's Wrestling Army, uh, W Wrestling Army on Twitter. And of course, follow Maria Canellas, follow Bobby Cruz, um, and follow Alyssa Marino as well. Uh, the three of us, or the four of us are all involved in making that show happen. And it's great stuff. Um, also follow Righteous Reg and Philip Lindsay. Those are my cohorts from Grap City and two guys that I would, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, imagine doing this podcasting stuff without at this stage and also you know i don't host it anymore but uh i still recommend if it's your type of show to check out rbr weekly wrestling talk there rbr wrestling on twitter fair enough it's it's all well worth doing guys so if you guys like this video make sure you like share and subscribe to tom talk Travis. follow me on twitter at tom talk Travis. follow bodyslam.net for my show of Cassidy haynes on twitter and youtube and and follow the Rest Watch podcast for updates on the podcast. And I will see you in the next one. Goodbye. Ah.